name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Last week we had that wonderful and joyful gathering where we came together, we celebrated the liturgy, we celebrated Vespers also, and we knelt a lot. Even those who I didn't expect to kneel managed to kneel a lot. And we prayed. We prayed for God to send the Holy Spirit upon us. We know that God is always sending the Holy Spirit upon the church. This is a mystery that continues, the mystery of Pentecost, which ceases to become a mystery because when the Holy Spirit is seen in the life of the church, it is no longer mystical, it is no longer hidden. It's manifest, it's shown, it's demonstrated. Which is probably why we celebrate this Feast of All Saints now. Because we celebrate on this octave after celebrating Pentecost, how the Holy Spirit has been demonstrated and shown to be definite in the life of the church. And that's in the life of people. The life of people of all different sorts with very many talents, with very many gifts, diverse gifts from the Holy Spirit. We know we live in a world in which when we hear as Orthodox Christians the, words diver the word diversity, these days we usually cringe because we know what diversity means. We go into woke language where we have to embrace anybody and everyone, whether they or their lives conform to the gospel or not. But today in this feast, we celebrate the most wonderful diversity, the diversity of the saints. One of the great joys every Sunday is to see what <coughs> floral offerings will come and will stand at the front. And over the months, we see things that are very, very different. Very different. Flowers and shrubs of all sorts of colours, of shapes, of characters, with different scents. And this is very much what the saints are for us. We look on this icon here where we have the Menologion for the whole year, and we see the most amazing bouquet, if you like, of holy people who are very different, who have very different colours and shapes and scents who bring many different things to the church. We have apostles and martyrs, we have hierarchs, we have teachers, we have the holy fools who appeal to me probably above all. We have so many different sorts of holiness. And all of these sorts, these forms, these variations and colours of holiness are all rooted in the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the gift of the Holy Spirit for which we prayed, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is continually poured on the church. And there we do see the sort of diversity that we as Christians do look for and do want, because it is all based in holiness. It is all based in the gospel. It is all based in fulfilling the law and of God and walking in his way. This is Christian diversity. We surround ourselves iconographically with the saints. We are rather starved here. I'm very grateful that when the deacon goes round each week, apart from the front, that we have icons arranged on the side so that they can be venerated, so that the saints in these icons can be honoured as models of holiness, as parts of this wonderful, wonderful variety and diversity in the church. And when we go home, we know in your houses we see icons. In some of your houses we see very many icons. And in each visit we see icon corners that expand as more and more icons of saints are added to them. As we discover more and more saints, as some of you go on holiday, you come back and you bring icons. And you bring things that link us with the saints. And this is always a great joy. We discover new saints. 
Somebody mentions to us, somebody asks us, have you read the life of this saint? Have you read the life of this elder who may not yet be recognised as a saint, but we know to be raised up by God? And so our knowledge of the saints expands, it grows, it becomes deeper. The question we must ask is what does all of this mean to us? What does our knowledge of the saints mean to us? What do the saints mean to us? What do their icons mean to us? Icons, we know, can be merely decorative items in any setting. People told me where they'd visited um, the houses of friends who may have gone to Greece after reading or seeing Captain Corelli's mandolin. And they were in, they were impressed by the beauty of Greek Orthodoxy. And they came, came home and they brought icons and they put them up. And people, Orthodox people, visited their houses and said, What do they mean to you? And of course the reply was, What do you mean? What do they mean to me? We brought them back from Greece. Yes, but they're saints, they're icons. What do they mean to you? Well, we think they look nice, they're nice. They remind us of Kefalonia, they remind us of Xanthi, they remind us of Rhodes. We know as Orthodox people this is not the way. And yet we have to challenge ourselves as well and say, what do the saints mean to us? Are they decorative aspects of the Orthodox life? Do they have a spiritual role in our lives? Because we can read the lives of the saints. And there are people here who are great readers and great lovers of the saints. And they read their lives and their lives are joined to the lives of the saints. They are impressed by them. They take lessons from them. They copy their examples. But equally we can have hundreds of icons. We can know about the lives of hundreds of saints and this can make no impact on our own lives. We can know all about the Holy Spirit. We can know all about the prayers. But unless we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit and seek the Holy Spirit, it means nothing in our life. When we look at the saints on this Sunday and every day of the year, when we open the calendar and we don't just see one saint, we may celebrate one saint in the services, but you'll see many, many saints. Those of you who may know or use the St. Herman calendar will see the saints of all sorts of countries, plus holy people who are yet to be canonised, but whom we consider to be saints and holy. We can read them all, we can know them all, we can have icons of them all, we can quote their lives, we can quote their miracles. And all of this can mean nothing. We have to embrace the saints. We have to embrace their lives. We have to embrace their examples. I was thinking yesterday we have to imitate their examples. And then I thought, is this the best word? We can do lots of imitation. We come across people who wish to imitate Saint Seraphim. And every day of the year they will greet you and say, Christos was crazy, Christ is risen. Some of them, the slightly more dotty ones, may call you Rados Moya, my joy. Does this mean anything? If this is mere imitation, mere imitation of the saints, we can all act piously. We can all make, not all perhaps, make pokloni. We can go through the motions. We can go through the actions which indicate holiness. But is it holiness if we are only imitating? It struck me there is no such thing as second-hand holiness. No such thing at all. There is no second-hand sanctity. There may be second-hand piety in the way that the West uses the word pious, usually with a sneer or a frown. Holiness has to be original and authentic. So, let's not imitate the saints. Let's emulate the saints in our lives. Let's look at their examples. 
and let's wish to embrace their examples and join that to our own lives. We need to emulate holiness. We need to say, how should this be operating in my life? How is it meant to work? How should I be acting out the gospel? <coughs> I'll be boring and again refer, as I do month by month, to the Beatitudes, the Blageni that we've heard, and to say, we don't need to know about them. We need to get on and do them. Sanctity isn't about what we know. Sanctity, holiness, is about what we do. So let's emulate the saints. Let's read their lives. Let's make it part of our living. And let's do this through a real relationship with the saints. In my bag, I have a book that I've read again that Karen must remind me to give back to her, which is the life of St. Yakovos of Evia. And what's so beautiful and touching in that life is the relationship that St. Yakovos had with St. David of Evia. And he would go and he would talk to St. David as the closest person to him. He would go. And he, sometimes he said he'd be a little bit grouchy with St. David. He'd say, look at these people, look at their problems, please, Father, please help me. Please go, please go to London, at one point he said. Please go to London and help this person in this operation. And he spoke with such warmth, with such simplicity. Some of you heard Bishop Irenae talk about the way some of St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco's spiritual children speak to him in the same way. They go to his room. They go to the chair where he died. They go to his icon in there. And they, and they make a bow. They make, make a poklan. And they, they say, Blagoslavike. They ask his blessing. They talk to him. And they say, Vladika, I'm here with problems. I'm here on behalf of other people. And they talk to St. John as though he was sitting in that chair in front of them. And it's in the warmth and the tenderness of these relationships with the saints that they become real in our lives. That they're not distant. I once went with a friend into her church, a Catholic church, and there were these distant saints, all stiff, on pedestals, upon the pillars. And I thought, oh dear, this is very different. I want to go up, be able to go up. I want to be able to open the kiot. I want to be able to pick up the icon. I want to hold it in front of me. I want to kiss this icon. I want to honor this saint and to speak to him or to her. And within that relationship, to seek holiness, to go away from that encounter to emulate their holiness. Not second-hand imitation, but original emulation. Why? Because it doesn't come from them. It comes from the gospel. The saints are reflections of the glory of God because they tried to live the life of the gospel. If we try to live the life of the saints, we are also living the life of the gospel. But we need to make it real. We need to come to the saints, not with this. We need to come to the saints with our hearts, to embrace them and to make their lives part of our lives, to make their icons even part of our lives, to make their feasts part of our lives, to come to them and to see God's holiness and to say, this holiness is the same holiness to which I am called. You have been baptised, I have been baptised. In baptism you have put on Christ, in baptism I have put on Christ. And what does it mean to put on Christ? It means that all of us should be living the life of holiness. And all of us should be seeking to become saints. There are children who have been asked by those adults who can't think what to say to a child. Hello dear, what do you want to be when you grow up? 
and occasionally you hear a child say, I want to be a saint. <laughs> and adults snigger and say, oh, you can't say that. That's what we all should be saying. For those of us that are growing up, for those of us who are still little people, we should be seeking to be saints because baptism at the cross and the resurrection calls us all to a life of holiness. So, let us embrace the saints. Let us love the saints. Go home today. Look at the icon of your name saint. Big people, take the little people home today. Take them to look at the icons of their saints. Talk about them. Tell them what it means. Kiss the icons. If necessary, revisit their lives and make it real because the reality is the reality of holiness. A very happy feast to all. Sparaznikum. Amen. <laughs>